Uh, in 94, uh, I won't go into great details at this moment, uh, uh, I burnt out. Uh, and, uh, well, just a few details. Uh, my wife was really sick, and uh, she'd been treated with TPN, which is this total product nutrition through an intravenous uh, shunt. And the specialist, uh, BGH, said, we've run out of money, we can't afford to give her another treatment. So she was down to 80 pounds, and we assumed that she would probably last in February. And I'm a man, if you hadn't noticed, and um, the way that we operate is, is to manage by objectives. So she will die in February, I'll work till Christmas, and then I will grieve. Well, it didn't work out that way. I, I nearly did. I nearly made it to Christmas. But um, um, on the 19th of December, I, uh, somebody asked me to, if they could have the ashes back of their deceased grandmother because they wanted to put them into another cemetery, which I didn't know was illegal. But apparently it was. So at the dead of one winter's afternoon, I was digging out ashes. And of course, the metaphor, it, 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 I, and I got back into my study and I was dizzy and palpitating and double vision and uh, weird. And I thought it was the coldness of this winter's afternoon and my vigorous act activity. Um, however, I'd been playing squash the day before, so I really didn't explain it, but it was my rationalization. And so uh, they rushed me to the hospital thinking I was having a heart attack. And, uh, uh, and in the end they said, well, we think you're having a panic attack. Why would I be having a panic attack? The sort of male separation of mind and heart still hadn't made any connections at all. So anyway, that year was the year that Christmas fell on a Saturday, therefore Sunday, you had Christmas Eve, and then the Sunday was Boxing Day. Um, so I, I, I woke up Boxing Day morning and thought, it's church again. And I, um, I made it, I made it to church, and I could feel the shapes beginning to really begin to rattle. And, um, the, the, yes? Can we close the door? Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. you. Might disturb other people out there. <laughs> 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 so, um, I thought, well, what I need to do is grab some sugar in the narthex, where we have a little coffee station, and, and I'll I'll get, get enough adrenaline to get through the sense. So I grabbed the sugar and knocked it back. But of course that created an adrenergic reaction. I spiked uh, three sentences into the sermon, and then the crash followed immediately following, and I, I was now uh, grinding to this terrible halt in the middle of the sermon, and eventually I found myself saying, I can't go on. Um, which was the most sensible thing I'd said in months. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> the warden sort of frog marched me out of the sanctuary, and Melissa, you, you don't know this part of the story, do you? <laughs> and this is a more recent member of St. Matthews. And um, so I, I got home, and um, uh, I was lying uh, on my bed, a long corridor, 46 feet, I think, to the living room. Um, long skinny house. Uh, my wife Julie had uh, Mozart playing quietly in the living room, and uh, she tells the story that I yelled, "Turn that din down!" <laughs> when you are in burnout, Mozart at 46 feet sounds like a din. So one of the symptoms. Um, but. Uh, uh, my recovery was um, physically quick because that's my DNA, emotionally slow because that's my DNA, family history, um, and spiritually even longer. And I'll talk about that as we go through in a more 
systematic process uh, the issue of Burma. So uh, it, it became my my life's work. Um, very shortly after I was in this deep hole called burnout, um, another clergy came to see me and said, look, um, I'm burnt out, and would St. Matthews take me on as a pastor in residence so that we might help, uh, so that St. Matthews might help, us, help me uh, <clears throat> get through my burnout. And, you know, again, I'm a male, and so I didn't say, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm in need, uh, I can't help you. I said, well, let's see what we can do. <laughs> so two, two lame people joined up and uh, found out about this program called Past in Residence. Um, and um, we went down to, to meet the uh, originator of the program in Washington and decided that we could do an annual conversion over a year. And subsequently, I then did two or three, I did three other uh, years with clergy who were burnt out, observing them over those years. And then, almost at the same time, I was asked if I'd join a team doing a, a clergy burnout uh, oasis workshop seven times a year. So for the last 17 years, I've been part of a team doing clergy burnout. And in one month's time, I have a book uh, coming out with a eminent psychiatrist in the States on burnout. So this is a topic which I love. <laughs> and it has become the most redemptive thing I do in, in my ministry is, is try to stop people getting burnt out. Because the slippery slope is, is so slippery that you can stop people getting it every month it goes on, it probably takes six months to come out of it. So if we can detect it early, um, then we save people enormous grief. So now, what are the sort of questions that you've, and what would you, what would you be disappointed if you didn't hear something about today? Um, so let's take five, ten minutes, and you tell me some expectations you have. What kind of schedule did you put yourself on that you heard up? Yes, I, I will address that. Yeah. Yeah, I will address that. That's very relevant. Yeah. How's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. There, there needs to be a balance between work and play to keep your sanity. I'd like to know signs of, for our pastor watching out for just even beginning signs. Of yeah, I've got 46, if that's all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in, three in three stages. <laughs> How people in the church can support their pastor in avoiding or doing our best to not get into that. I think that's the essence of, of what we're doing here today, is, uh, is you be the eyes that see, but then seeing the symptoms and diagnosing correctly is only halfway. You're going to deal with some very stubborn people. Yeah? And that's your biggest challenge. <laughs> that word you just used, challenge. You don't want to burn anyone out, but you still want to challenge them. How do I find the balance there to challenge my clergy? Well, uh, that, that's the type, uh, uh, this isn't the time uh, that those on the watch, but it's how do you live between rust out and burnout? You, you don't want to monocolor clergy so that they don't burn out and, and put them in a rocking chair and bring them hot chocolate. You, you know, that's probably not <laughs> what we're after. <laughs> but neither do you want to um, strap them to a running machine and, uh, and leave the running machine while you go on holiday. <laughs> Further to the question uh, about um, how the congregation can help the clergy if uh, it's uh, burnouts being detected, uh, I think that the, the other question is how would um, the congregation um, uh, um, like accept or because um, most congregations they have a very high expectation of the clergy, yes, and um, how would the congregation come to term that? They are human too, and they, they right. can burn out. Yeah. And how would the congregation uh, help each other to help the clergy? Uh, yeah, managing expectations is, is so key um, with clergy's multiple um, uh, job descriptions, and really, in a sense, we have as many employers as parishioners. 
And so managing that is, is part, part of this conversation. Sure. And and I, I think of uh, Moses and uh, Jesuit. Perfect illustration. I'll actually get you to give that in a minute. That, yeah. That's in the text. <laughs> yes. Another concern I have is it's not about how busy he is, but for mm -hmm. so much as um, inevitably if a minister is going to be a minister for 30 to 40 years, uh, at some point of his life he's going to feel very dry. Yeah, absolutely. But still feel, yeah. feel very guilty about spewing out words that he doesn't really need. Right. Um, and that spiral can move into burnout, I would imagine. Yes. So at what point can we help our minister director to be <coughs> transparent enough that he can say, um, I don't believe anymore, even though it might be temporary. You know what right. I'm saying? Um, you don't want him to go there, but at the same time, if he does go there and feels guilty, he's going to go into a black hole. Um. I, I think that's going to be actually beyond the scope that I can possibly get to, although I, I recognize what you're To me, that's part of really succession planning and how churches and clergy who are getting older um, need to be uh, getting work done through younger people who have the energy and the vision and the passion. Um, uh, and, but it's essential to what burns out older people. You're right. Um, um, it, 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 this is such a vast topic, actually. And, and I'm only going to give you just a tiny fraction of what's actually in the book. Um, but you all have to buy the book now. So. <laughs> <laughs> but the taste will be so good, you'll be forced to buy it. Anything else before I get rolling? <clears throat> um, I, I, I do hope that this won't be the typical definition of a lecture. You know the definition of a lecture that the, next, the professor becomes the next student without passing through the minds of either. <laughs> I could give you the notes so that you know, our minds could be completely relaxed this afternoon. But, um, I, uh, I'd like to engage you. So, I don't remember which button that was. I think it was that one. Yeah, it's How about that? Uh, here we are. We're off. Okay, so the challenge is living between uh, rust out and burnout. So what are those, uh, those two options? Um, rust out people are risk aversive. They, they retreat from challenges. Thank you so much. That's right. Thank you. Um, uh, People who um, avoid conflict um, are, are actually probably less likely to burn out. Um, that they tend to simply change churches more often um, because they're simply not going to deal with the issues. Um, but the people who, who uh, or on the other side of that are the, are the burnout folk, and uh, their experience of ministry and life is that they've simply put out one too many fires, and they, don't give me another conflict. Um, I can't cope with Mozart, uh, Mozart at 4650. You know, that's, that's another issue. It's sound, it's stimulus. I can't deal with another stressor. Um, and of course, that's such an extreme experience of it's overstimulation. And Moses up overstimulates if you were in serious trouble. <laughs> and I was. Um, uh, and of course, you need to know what got me there. And it wasn't it actually, you know, I, I let myself off the hook in one sense because you all, all put it down to my wife dying. But that wasn't. That wasn't what that yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> so burnout. Um, uh, I want to suggest to you that uh, of living between rust out and burnout is actually rocket science. Um, that what we're really wanting to do is, as, as people who are committed to Christ, is we want to finish our our our, our ministry. And then die. 
and, and so that, you know, the, the capsule goes on to heaven, the, the rocket falls off and goes into the ground. Um, and that we timed it perfectly. We, we, we break through gravity and the forces, all the forces that are holding us back. And um, uh, we have this, we go out in this wonderful firestorm and <laughs> the angels uh, delight in this uh, perfect timing. Um, but you see, the problem is that most of us are being led and controlled by forces that most of us are actually not even aware of. I had no idea of the forces that were working me that led me to burn out. Uh, but now that I know what those forces are, I'm so far from the potential of burning out, even though my workload is absolutely quadruple. The responsibility I have now compared to what I had when I burnt out is, uh, it is quite astronomical. Uh, the stresses that I live with today are so much greater than they were back then, work-related. Um, so I, I'm explaining here, here the myth that it's having a difficult job that causes you to burn out. Otherwise all presidents and prime ministers and CEOs would burn out. And they, they actually tend to thrive on it. And actually I'm so bored these days that I... Um, I, I do endless mediation, uh, where I step in the midst of, uh, between dioceses and between denominations and, <clears throat> and let them fight each other with me in the middle, just for fun. <laughs> um, I actually do do that. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the journey from being a very fearful person to, to, to being to having that part of my damaged nature redeemed by the Lord. Which is quite, it's quite a lovely journey, really. Um, I want to suggest to you that actually Jesus managed control burnout remarkably well, as we might expect. Oh, sorry, I've gone too far here. Um, I'm having a, see, the lead isn't long enough for me to bring the computer in front of my nose for my old eyes to see clearly. So I'm squinting over there, hoping I'm on the right page, but yeah, we'll get there. Um, Jesus controlled that now. How did, tell me how Jesus controlled the forces that were at work at the beginning of his uh, curacy, the beginning of his ministry. What were the forces driving him to do regarding his job description? Yeah, what were the crowds wanting, demanding? See miracles. Yeah, heal everybody. Yeah, and um, there's a long line up outside the door of appointments waiting for you. And uh, how did he define his own job description? Must be above my father's business. Ah, oh, my goodness, that goes through the heart. That's wonderful. That's exactly. Um, he imposed his expectations for himself upon himself, didn't he? He said that at age 12. Uh, yes, that's <laughs> right. Yes. And, and he grew in the, the, the Luke 2.52, is the, the, the only verses we have for his teenagers in 20 years. And but look at those. I, I quoted them yesterday, so that's why uh, you may, no, you wouldn't remember them yesterday. But anyway, I said yesterday that he grew in stature and wisdom. And in, in, in um, is that word harmony? No, harmony. Favor. Favor with God. Um, so tell me about the end of Jesus' life. What were the forces, what, what was the job description coming from the disciples? Garden of Gethsemane? I was going to say he died young. Uh, well, no, they were trying to keep him alive. Yeah, no, it's the opposite, isn't it? Really? Yeah. The forces were saying, don't go to the cross. And Jesus defines, he controls his own destiny. He says, you know, get behind me. My destiny is here. So, looking at that and looking at a typical clergy person, I I, I, I in my experience with people at burnout, and I have to say, I've been with an awful lot over 17, uh, 17 years, 
and three, four, four years of full-time work with Bernadette. They've all been controlled by their parishes. That's the common denominator. They were not in control of their job description. Now, I do want to suggest that there always has to be, in an Anglican system, a balance between episcopally led and synodically governed. So, a leader creates vision, and the board or the synod works to see, to, to test that, to, to balance it, to harmonize it. Um, but we see far more burnout in congregational churches. Why do you think that would be? Too many opinions. Too many opinions. Uh, yeah, too much power at the congregational level. They, they, there's no episcopal land here. It's, it's all synodically governed, congregational government. And therefore, um, so many clergy in the, in the independent churches will tell me uh, that I was afraid for my job. And, and so I, I had to conform. Um, Trevor, isn't it a case that each year when the Baptist minister, he wondered whether they're going to decide to keep him for another year? Yes. So you go into the annual meeting, wonder if you want to have a job tomorrow. Absolutely. So, um, you know, Anglican uh, clergy uh, are extraordinarily fortunate. Um, in contrast, for that one reason, um, it, it, there's, there's, there's more job security because archdeacons, when they're like Daryl, will get involved and and assist the process and mediate it before it gets to, you know, potentially a firing. So, job descriptions play a role, but they really don't, in the end, determine the burnout. Um, they can make people very unhappy, and so I really want to suggest that you need to attend to, to job descriptions. So here's another example around the job descriptions. At the end of, um, when you do an annual vision, and you do your strategic planning, as you were instructed this morning. Um, um, okay, so we've got three new goals this year, right? As our parish council came up with three wonderful new goals. And if that's the end of the process, there's one vital piece missing here. Do you know what it is? Who's going to do it? So what should the clergy person at this point then say? Because he's got three from last year and three from the year before, and three from the year before. <laughs> so what does the clergy question now say to, to the leadership team? Prioritize. Yeah. Prioritize. Which of the 23 other goals that you've given me over the last 12 years would you like me to let go of in order to do these three? You don't have to be cynical because that, but the, 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 the end of the statement is the one that counts. What do you need me to let go of in order to fulfill these three goals? Now. When the leadership team does the work with the clergy person and says, well, I guess, you have to let go of this, then, then the clergy person has to say something else. I need the warden to announce that on Sunday morning. It doesn't come from me. It comes from someone who can defend me. And you know, that's this, what I've just shared with you is what's the price of admission in terms of what that will do for, for the clergy. That, that, that will already save them enormous hassle. So when Mr. Thompson comes to me and says, um, I need you to do this, and I say, well, actually, the parish council have determined that this year I need to spend my time over here. He gets mad, but as much with the parish council as with me. And that's a great gift to me. <laughs> All right, so control them now. Um, how do we control our destinies? Um, all righty. Uh, well, let's look at the symptoms of burnout. And um, I've got about nine up here. But since that time, I've done more work. And so they, the nine have now become 46. <laughs> <laughs> Pass this back to me. Now, we certainly don't have time to look at all 46. Um, I, 
Okay, this is what I'm going to ask you to do, just to, uh, to get you engaged with the material. Okay. Yes. 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 Two more. Go now. Yeah. And there's even more. Oh. Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. Uh, and, uh, two things I want you to do. One, go through the list and circle any that apply to you. Uh, because you may be surprised. And secondly, um, and much safer, of course, do it about your clergy person. Now, if you are one of and the same, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you what you do. You do it as if you were a parishioner looking at you and see what you think they think. All right. So I'll give you five, ten minutes to um, go through the list and a couple of, couple of different, cir a circle and a cross yourself. And I'm not going to get you to share this. No. This is just to get you engaged with the material.
comes up of how does this relate to current thinking in the field of psychiatry. The short answer is that the author's concepts and techniques are compatible, in my opinion, with the mainstream practice of the American Psychiatric Association, with some minor exceptions. Um, the American Psychiatric Association lists all its diagnoses in the DSM, now five. Um, the author's proposed diagnosis of external affirmation syndrome, which is what I'm now referring to as the cause of burnout, um, um, uh, is, is not uh, in the DSM, but does not imply incompatibility. Uh, and he goes on to say, um, uh, and he said, and who knows, and perhaps this will be in DSM five in years to come, which I, well, to me was the most exciting thing I've ever heard in my life, because that was never my intention when I began this journey years ago. Uh, and the exception he points out later on is that this is faith-based. Psychiatrists, not faith-based, so that's the exception. Um, now you have to recognise that this list of symptoms is extensive. Therefore, it's overlapping. You, you, you'll see people with uh, PTSD and uh, GAD, um, anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders, who have similar symptoms. But the thing is, when the more you check off, uh, so therefore I expect people have to check off uh, quite a number. Um, the last person I put this through uh, last two weeks ago, uh, a priest in a diocese in the States, um, who I suspected of burnout, he said, by the way, would you be willing to fill us in? He filled in uh, 20 of 23 in stage one, um, um, 11 out of 12 stage two, and five in stage three. So I was very pleased with that, in the sense that, that I, he seemed to me to be burnt out and um, uh, completed the inventory and said, you know, yes, I, I think you're right. <laughs> was he still functioning? <laughs> no, <laughs> not well, not well at all. Um, uh, now, I have to be very careful not to distract myself because I, I, uh, I, I've got a destination where I'd like to be. Um, but feel free if you want to stop at any point and engage. Um, I want to talk about the difference between uh, emotional, physical, mental, and spiritual burnout. They're, they're all different. Um, what order are they going to happen? Mental, physical, emotional, spiritual burnout. Which is going to come first? I gave you a hint when I was telling you my story. Sorry? Each to their own. I, I, this is what happened to me, you see. I, um, they were trying to diagnose me, so they sent me to, the, um, uh, to a heart specialist. And, um, so I'll tell you a funny story first. Um, first of all, he, um, he was a friend of uh, uh, my squash mom, who was a GP. Um, so that's, you need to know that part of the story. So he, he says, OK, well, we'll begin with a treadmill test. So he put me on a treadmill and said, now, we've got to get your heart rate up to 60, um, 160. And so I was walking, and uh, he said, that's not working. Um, you have to go faster. So can you uh, walk quickly? He said, yes, I can. And there were a line of people like this immediately behind the treadmill, you see. And uh, they're looking on at this, uh, all heart patients, of course, uh, ready to 
pop it uh, with a heart attack, and already had a heart attack. And um, so then he, he checks the machine, no, nope, sorry, you're nowhere near the, the target break. Uh, can, you, can you jog? I said, well, yes, I can jog, yeah. So I started jogging. And these people in the front row were going, ashy. Uh, because they were next. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the end, he said, well, can you run faster? I said, yes, I can. He said, but excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, would you just stand over there, please? Because he was afraid I was going to stop and fly off. <laughs> and now, they were shaking, like leaves as they went, went over here, you see. So, anyway, at the end of all of this, he... Um, he interviewed me afterwards, and he, uh, I said to him, you know, uh, do you have any concerns? And he said, uh, yes, I do. He said, I'm really concerned about your squash player. <laughs> <laughs> My friend is in danger. <laughs> uh, that was the good part. That was the good news, you see. But then he said to me, well, tell me about your, your family history. Anybody in your family suffer from any psychological issues? Why? Well, it's both... Yeah, my mother um, uh, had a breakdown when I was four. And, um, oh, what about your siblings? Uh, well, yes, my, my sister suffers from anxiety. Um, your children? Yes, I have um, a, a son who suffers from anxiety. Oh, well then. Who <laughs> deeply offended me? <laughs> well, we know what your problem is. And I, I did not appreciate that. So, I, in fact, at this point, I was saying, to, couldn't you just make it my heart and give me surgery? I'm not... <laughs> I'll take a heart attack. I don't want to be labeled as, a, as someone who has emotional problems. And then he tried to sort of soften me by saying, look, um, you can't get away with your, your genes, your genes. Um, we're predisposed uh, to be vulnerable either physically, and you're not, <laughs> or emotionally, and you are, um, and so you just, you have to work with what you've got, and, and realize that you, we are vulnerable in different places. So, so hence, you see, I, I tried to walk around the block on January the 1st of 95, and I had to sit down on the park bench, and this was just, this was bizarre for me, having been active all my life. By January the 10th, I was back playing tennis. Um, but the panic t attacks continued for oh, a, at least a year. And they were really incredibly <coughs> difficult to deal with. So the worst thing I've ever had to deal with was panic attacks. Um, uh, but spiritually, I lived under this burden um, of the inner conflict for a, a long time, and uh, it was a couple of years before that healed. So, you can't, I can't say that it'll happen in this order, A, B, C, D, E, uh, but I can say that um, uh, it'll happen likely according to predictable DNA, that, that if you dig a bit about the family history, you're likely see what's going to go out, blow out first. <clears throat> um, but what I do want to get to is the, is under spiritual. This is, this is in terms of burnout for urging the killer. If you experience an existential crisis, it's a crisis of why. There's not an acronym like, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, The why question, and so what, what's the why question, the spiritual why question is, why God did you let this happen to me? And that creates then dissonance between what you believe and what you're currently experiencing. I believe that God was a loving God. He had a purpose in my life and would protect me, etc, etc, etc. My lived reality now at 94 is that I have a wife who appears to be dying, and I have three small children, and I'm failing my church, my children, and my wife. And I'm now outside uh, uh, Foothills Hospital in Calgary at 11 30 at night, yelling as loudly as I could without being admitted to Unit 22, which was the psych unit. I'm yelling, 
there's nothing you could ever do, you could bring out of this experience that could justify it. Right? That's my burnout. In other words, you cannot redeem this level of suffering. It's unredeemable. Now, I'll give you a metaphor for, um, for the why question. Uh, the why question puts me in the judge's chair, and uh, if this is the dock, it's God in the dock. And I'm saying, um, answer, uh, justify why you have done what you have done, because it's inexcusable. It's unacceptable, and I have judged you as not being loving. Right? That's what the why question is doing. Now, the what question, which is far more therapeutic, nobody told me about this. So, so I, I, I stayed in my why question for two years. Um, so my, my spiritual burnout lasted longer than I think if somebody told me that I'd be better off asking the what question. So the what question is this. Um, I now am in the dock, and God is back in his throne, and I say to him, this is a mess. Uh, this is an unbelievable mess. This is terrible. What can you do to redeem this? I can't see any way that you could redeem this, but I'm not God. And there might be a possibility from your perspective that, that, that you know something I don't. <laughs> might. Might. I don't think he does. But, <laughs> but I'm accepting my humanity for just a moment. <laughs> um, uh, it's an extremely liberating place to be, back in the what question. Uh, when, you, when you're overwhelmed with life's traumas, um, uh, the sovereignty of God is the thing that gets eaten up. One of the things that some of my very good friends did for me uh, uh, 12 years after the event I described, because Julia did get another treatment from a different specialist and lived another 12 years. Um, but when Julia was in the final stage of her life, um, on life support in, uh, in Surrey Memorial Hospital, I'd go early in the morning and she was uh, non-responsive at that point, um, and I'd stay there for an hour or two, and my friends would come and capture me. And, drive me down to Washington State, to the Cascade Mountains, and we'd go up to a lookout at 7,000 feet. And um, I was so done in by the time I got to the lookout. <laughs> but, and I was so surrounded by the mountains and the sovereignty of God that, that by the time I got to 7,000 feet in the lookout, my why question was somewhat on the trail because I couldn't carry it any longer. And, and, and so that was therapeutically very powerful for me. Uh, having uh, the why question consumed on the mountain and, and the sovereignty of all that God has done, restored. Uh, <clears throat> how does I get sidetracked so many ways in this journey? <laughs> okay, really okay. Um, now, now we're trying to dig a bit deeper to um, what are, the, what are the things that actually prevent this business of controlling burnout, controlling the rocket, controlling um, the forces that, that want to drive us? Um, the, the, I want to say that what drives us in the most dangerous fashion is the internal conflict, the ones that are actually inside of us. External forces come and go. Um, bishops come and go. <laughs> Prime ministers come and go. Um, uh, but I live with myself every day. And I, I wake up with the same drivenness every day. Um, and it needs to be managed. Um, 
And because of the shortness of our time together, I'm going to skip some of the ex other, other obstacles. Uh, we touched on that one briefly. Um, uh, that's an internal conflict which will lead some people up the difference between what they want and what they're able to do. They have a vision for something, but they don't have maybe the skills or the resources to fulfill it. But that's not terribly potent, that one. <laughs> um, what drives you and what you desire for yourself? Well, it's getting a bit more potent. Um, in the, the late 60s, um, transactional analysis was very popular, and uh, clergy were pretending to be amateur psychologists in those days. And one of the fun things about TA was they, they got you to do what was called a program. Uh, to discover whether you were programmed in some way. So they said to you, said to, said to us, what would you, where are you right now? And I read down, stressed. Where would you like to be in 10 years? Less stressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and where will you be in 10 years' time? More stressed. <laughs> 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 well, Here's a man divided against himself. Yeah. You know, my drive, my longing to be less stressed and have less responsibility, because I assumed that was the problem. Uh, somehow I knew I was programmed in such a way that I couldn't achieve what, what I needed for my peace of mind and, <coughs> and well-being. So what were those forces inside me that were driving me in the direction I did not want to go? like the crowd driving Jesus, uh, and yet Jesus could resist. Well, at this point we're going to skip on, because um, <clears throat> I, I want to say, say to you that, that Jesus, um, Jesus had his cup filled when he went into ministry, and I did not. Jesus... Um, is the, you should have a cup for this, or this cup over there. Right. Is that empty or full? Mm -hmm. Good. Wonderful. I'm sure that's fully empty in a minute. Um, uh, if we assume the fundamental task of parents is to affirm children, and, and if it's like a cup that the, the children are given and the parents fill up the cup, um, then clearly Jesus had his cup filled up by his father. Uh, he was affirmed. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You don't have to do anything more to please me. So pleasing his father and his ministry, his work, got detached. The train and the caboose were not connected. There was a siding so that they were running on, they were not linked together. So in other words, my doing well doesn't mean that the Father is pleased with me more. But what happens if you go into ministry, as I did, I never use one of these, and I know why. You can't dismantle the bottom. Styrofoam cups are wonderful. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've done my best, but I'm not going to succeed. Starbucks, you've overcome me. Um, I, if, if I could pierce a hole in the bottom of this cup, it would be a much better image. Uh, I might ruin your pen, but we, we could work on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's going to work. Put a hole in my foot hand. Oh, it did work. Well done. Thank you. Okay, so my parents, my father in particular, uh, I came home with a report card in Tennessee, and he would say, um, you know, it'd be really good if that could be a, a, a B minus because, you know, you, you want it to be able to do A levels and get into university, and et cetera. And so I go, go away and work come back and B minus. Well, you know, it's okay, but you know, really it should be a B. And month after month and year after year, the carrot, the reward, was always out of reach. 
there was no no opportunity to, to celebrate a success. It was always inadequate. In other words, I had disappointed my father to the point that I had disappointed my father. I am a disappointment to my father. Um, it is now ontological. It's part of me. It's not just an achievement. It's not a difference with a B and a B minus. It is Trevor does not please his father. It's a futile quest for perfection. It was. Excellence would have been good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but as a child, I didn't know that. You weren't there to tell me that. <laughs> and you know what? As an adult, I still didn't know that. And so... But wasn't your father trying to encourage you to do better? He was. And you know what? He, I wonder, well, he succeeded, because I'm still producing. <laughs> Frantically producing. But I'm producing now because I want to. Not because I think you'll like me more. There's a difference. It's got unrealistic expectations. I had hugely unrealistic expectations. The, what did I do in my first job as a curate with my first bishop? What, what happened with my first bishop? I had a desperate need for him to say, well done. Well done. Well done. And he didn't know what his job was. <laughs> and so I was very irritated at him that I worked my buns off to do all the things I thought would, would please him. And he never said, well done, Trevor. In those days, they used to have an annual honors list. That they, they would, he would go through people who had done significant things in the diocese. I wasn't on the list. It was, it was so disappointing. But more than disappointing, it was, it was, it was hitting at the heart of my worth. I wasn't a worthwhile person because the bishop hadn't been hadn't affirmed me. So I live now with with a cup, with a hole in the bottom, and I I take up an offering. Please tell me I'm okay. Um, uh, I have about six ways after preaching a sermon of getting you to tell me I preached a good sermon without actually saying to you outright, was it a good sermon? External affirmation. <coughs> it's it's people-pleasing. And now, you see, it, there's a whole litany of issues that go with this. If I'm a people-pleaser, uh, can I lead effectively? No, no, no. Because I, I cannot take people to hard places. So I'm reduced to being a pastor. Right? I can take care of everybody. But I cannot be um, an apostle, a prophet, or an evangelist. Um, because they, apostle, prophet, prophet evangelist, apes, they, 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 they don't shave, and they make loud noises, and they frighten people. And, uh, and I couldn't do that. You know, I had to be very conventional, shape, and um, I, I couldn't disturb people. But now I'm not fulfilling my destiny because I have a vision of leading. I have a vision of where we need to be, but I don't have the resources emotionally to take you there. Um, do you find that social media is magnifying this problem? Can you say more? But do you find that social no, media, I, 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 in what, terms of um, our culture, is adopting an attitude of we are measuring our worth by how many page views, how many likes, how many shares? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, it's not a grace based society, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, meritocracy. Let's, let's speak it on. Um, well, yesterday, it should be shame. Um, and what did Jesus say about from, uh, about affirmation? He said, "Woe to you if all speak well of you, 
because you, you're in trouble. If you please everybody, you, you're, you're not leading, you're pastoring, you're following, you're burden bearing. Um, you must be overworking. Um, but did he say, woe well, to you if any speak well? No, affirmation is a good thing. But it's when you're addicted to having it all the time that you are serious, you're, you're in a state of woe at that point. Um, Paul said in Galatians 1.10, if, st- if I was still looking for the approval of people, in one verse it says I would not be in the ministry, or I would not be a servant of Christ, this is the usual translation. Um, and, and he's dealing with these Galatians, uh, and he's having to have a hard word to them. Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who's taking you into this path that is a wrong path? And I'm here to tell you that you've taken a wrong path. Now, he's being the apostle. Uh, he's not being the pastor, because they don't like this. Uh, and he knows that for him to be the apostle is to not get their approval. So here we have expectation management about what it is to lead. In other words, if I do the right thing, they'll hate me. But that's a wonderful way of coping in certain ministry situations. You set up the expectation, I'm going to do the right thing, and you're not going to like me. So when I go into a high-level mediation, um, I'm going to set up the situation in the correct way, and likely they'll turn on me, because they need to turn on somebody. And, and they're welcome. But it's their issue. And they're not going to take it personally. And I'm going to give it back to them. And <laughs> 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 you pay for it. I should have found out how you do that in the church. <laughs> I can do this for free. I'm going to check it. Uh, symptoms of uh, external affirmation syndrome. Feeling unworthy. Well, I live with a cup that's empty. I don't feel worthy. Um, feelings of not belonging. I, I don't really fit. Uh, inferiority, needing approval. This is a sad thing. When someone takes an offering, we might give them an offering begrudgingly, but actually, the offering they got doesn't equal the lack of respect we now feel about them taking an offering because it's so obvious. And it's a terrible price to pay. Um, when I was my first year of ministry, uh, two senior clergymen didn't know I was in the room. And they were talking about how needy I was. And, and, and it was so painful. And, and they were quite affirming at one level. They said, he's very skilled, but he's so needy. And it was so true. It was so true. And I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that there was a hole in my cup. Um, needing to have people tell you, you're OK. Am I doing this OK? Uh, I mean, I, I, is the lecture going all right? I mean, tell me I'm okay. <laughs> okay. How much yeah. control? Oh, thank you. How much control do you have over number two? Um, well, I mean, I mean, you're, I know you're you're in a symptom here, maybe not. Uh, I'm some groups are going to reject you, and you've got no control over, over that whatsoever. But, but um, it's the internal, not the external dynamics that we're talking about. Um, Tend to hate conflict. I've got many more of these symptoms, but um, we talked about what the cup is. The parents' responsibility is to fill the cup with affirmation. Um, now, this is where it gets really difficult. This is the point that people run to the hills when I say, I want you to write down a list of the ways in which your parents, uh, the offenses your parents committed against you by not affirming you. Oh my goodness. Now, if you're in the States, you say, we're pleading the fifth. Uh, but if you're in Canada, you can still plead the fifth, but it's the fifth commandment. 
and you've got you you meant to be honouring. How can I be honouring my parents if I'm naming ways in which they sinned? And and usually it takes me a session or two with someone before I can actually get them to tell the truth about their parents. And uh, let me let me tell you the typical response I get uh, from people. Uh, Uh, this is the response I get from people is that they, they want desperately to excuse their parents. But let me let me <clears throat> tell you what excusing your parents will do for you. It usually goes like this. Um, well, you know, my, my parents had a hard time growing up. Um, they actually they did the best they could. Uh, they were actually struggling when I was a child. You know, the relationship was very difficult. And my dad spent long hours of work trying to help the family survive. And that's why he wasn't there, of course, to um, uh, Trying to avoid the mistake of their parents, they swung the opposite way. Uh, worrying about money made my dad angry, um, but they were really trying to like make my life better um, through working really hard to give our life to, to make our life better. Well, you know, my parents didn't know any better. In that age, there was no education, no classes on affirmation and the importance of it. Um, actually, they were sick. They they literally didn't have the you emotional know, mental energies to be able to affirm. Uh, it was the culture that shaped them, um, but of course it's changed today, the culture around raising children. It won't do any good to stir the stuff up. It should just be left alone and buried. And you see, the unspoken fear is if I dig this up, I might lose the little affirmation I got. And, and then where would I be? I, you know, I can cope with it. I, I can cope with my parent children. It's not a big deal. And, and I tell you, when we're at this stage of the list, the hair is often standing up in the back. Of this is a fight for an emotional survival. Um, and you know something's going on because the strength of these responses is so powerful. What are they? You know, what, what's going on right now? Um, actually, you know, my parents became Christians when I was 12. And my dad, after 12, was completely different. I have just excused 0 to 12. That doesn't count, because he wasn't a Christian. He may have shot three or four people in those early years, and we can excuse that too, I presume. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in many ways, my dad was a good father. I can think of two or three, alongside the 45, in ways in which he wasn't. And I prefer to look at two or three. If my father knew the impact on me of what his parenting had done, it would destroy him. It would do no good to stir the sun. It's okay, because actually I've got broad shoulders. Actually, I'm a burden bearer now. Uh, that's my primary ministry. I'm a burden bearer. And it's okay, because you see, the reality is, I'm not worth it. See, for me to raise this issue, so I, I have no worth. So uh, why should I raise an issue which will affect someone else's worth? And I've just told you the cost of excusing your parents' failure to affirm. I will carry their sin, and their sin is that I am a person created by God with no worth. And 
lest we treat the root cause of burnout, we might put a false bottom in the cup. But you see, this is not the right cup. <laughs> That's a utilitarian cup. I'm not a utilitarian person. I'm a person who pleases God, who God loves, whether I give his lecture or not. I don't have more merit because I've just given this lecture. Um, if I annoy half of you in this lecture, it doesn't change my, my worth. <laughs> if I disturb you greatly and you mutter rude things about how it went, that's, that, that's not my intention in the first place, and if that was an unexpected result, it doesn't change my worth. So when I say, my dad sinned against me, and I'm actually going to give that, that to God. I mean, forgiveness, my definition of forgiveness is to say, God, this is what was done against me that was not what you intended for my life. And um, rather than me holding on to it and judging it, I'm going to say, look, you take it. You take my father's parenting. You work out all the excuses for him if you, if the, if, you know, any excuses, I'm sure that I got one, is it? I 17 excuses, I'm sure that God could come up with 34 if he needed to. But I don't think that generally God is in the business of excusing. I think he's in the business of forgiving. Now, you see, some of you are really struggling over this. So what I, what I will now say to you is, okay, if, if you have children, I mean to say to you, what is going to happen if your 17-year-old, as my 17-year-old, came to me and dad said, Dad, you weren't there for me when I was growing up. You were visiting mum or at the church, and I was needing you at home. And out of my mouth the first time came, but you have no idea what I was going through. Do you know how damaging that was for him? Because what did I just do to him? You didn't validate his feelings. I didn't validate him. You're right. He was the worst. That's the message I just gave him. Look, you don't count. Yeah. I count. Everything else counts. Yeah. He needed me to say, Will you forgive me? Forget the excuses. Let's leave that aside. Did I deserve to be affirmed as a child? That's what he's asking me. And the answer is yes. You did. You deserve to be treated differently. Whether I had the resources to do it or not, you deserve to be experienced that you pleased me and that I loved you. And, and it took me several attempts before I could finally say, you're right. You're absolutely right. I wasn't there for you. Even though in my heart of hearts, it breaks my heart to, to, to know I wasn't there. I wanted to be there, but I wasn't. And actually, in hindsight, I, I would have done things differently. You know, I, I, I would have taken more time off work. Um, but I didn't, because I needed to work, because that's where my work was. So my brokenness, which part of my in a part of the sin order that passed down, I perpetuated sin, and sin damaged my son. Nowadays, people talk so much about. Could you speak up so people are yes. I can hear? Yeah. Well, nowadays, you know, the culture, young children growing up, there's this culture of self esteem, and the parents are, are, are to to say that they're oh, uh, well done, even though it's obviously wrong <laughs> and uh, and obviously uh, uh, mediocre, and, and all the teachers would say, well done. And how would that affect, um, you know, in the long term, the, the burnout thing? Or, or, yes. or you know, it's a different 
standard? It's, how, how, how does that? that it's a flip flop. You? You're absolutely right. It's not. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, Mark came to me. See, I I tried. You see, I I, I knew that I did not experience that most. I knew that I needed to affirm my kids. So one day, Mark came to me and said, "You know, um, you spent a lot of time affirming our achievements." Mm -hmm. But you haven't yet affirmed me. Ah. And he was right. I didn't know how to. And can I be excused because I didn't know how to? No, I cannot be. I, I mean, I, I prefer to be excused than forgiven. <laughs> but um, uh, I needed my kids' forgiveness. Um, so my point is, if it works with your children, then you cannot have a different set of rules for your parents. You cannot wipe out their, their behavior, but take yours really seriously. If you have damaged your kids and you know it and you need their forgiveness, then surely you've been damaged. Likely damaged by your parents. But, but I don't advocate um, going to parents with a list. Um, actually, I, I don't think that is helpful at all. It's between you and God. Your parents can be dead, and this process works phenomenally well because you're picturing going back to your parents with the list and uh, working with uh, people whose parents have been dead many years, uh, they'll picture those parents in the same house, whether they're alive or dead. And what becomes critical in this process is that when I go to the parents and say, look, um, I, I need to give back to you the responsibility for your parenting. Uh, and, it's, and it's results in me. Uh, you should get four responses. Uh, in the this is in the imagination, not in the reality. The, the first response is uh, that the parent will, will stay behind the newspaper. <laughs> not come out. <laughs> and that, that, of course, was the way they, they engaged with the child. They didn't pay attention. And actually, that was part of the damage for the child. Never forget my father's attention. He was either watching TV or out somewhere or behind the news. Couldn't engage him. And so I didn't feel valued. So part of the challenge at this moment in this, in this picturing of the encounter is um, the therapy at this point involves us coaching the adult now uh, to be able to say, are you going to be defined by your father's indifference. So, do you believe you have worth? Yes, I do. Well then, whether your father ignores you or not, your job is to say, well, okay, Dad, if you're not going to pay attention, that's perfectly fine. It's not actually perfectly fine, but it's not the end of the story, because you're getting this list <laughs> whether you choose to receive it or not. What matters is, will I leave with, my, with your garbage back out the front door? I'm leaving the garbage there. Now, some parents will get angry as a means to throw you off, to disarm you, to intimidate you, to, to get you to leave with your garbage, with their garbage. Some will be as nice as my, my mother is the sweetest person on earth. And so when I was about 20 months, she said, you know, we really didn't do that bad a job as parents, did we? <laughs> to which externally I said to mum, no, mum. And internally I said, mum, you're not getting away with that. <laughs> you're not making me responsible for your parenting. You will need still to take responsibility, mum. She didn't need to know that. I needed to know that. Now, one of the things I had, you know, people teach me all the time in, in these counseling sessions, and I've been doing this for 25 years. 
Um, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, we talked about leaving the styrofoam cup behind, and I'm not a useful person, I'm a person. Um, and they said, you know, I think my mother knows where my real cup is, which I thought, well, that sounds a bit weird, I'm not sure I want to go down that road, but okay, tell me about it. She said, I, well, I think it's in the china cabinet, and um, it's, it's tarnished and unused. I said, well, you know, if you want to ask her for it. And uh, so the mother went to the china cabinet, gave her the cup, and she said, I didn't know what to do with this. And, and um, it struck me as such a perfect picture of a parent being given the task of parenting and didn't know what to do with it. Um, their task was to, to, to treasure this child and to affirm this child and love this child, and they didn't know how to do it. And, and, and that was God's intention for this child, to be loved and affirmed and treasured. And um, so uh, this person received the cup and polished it up, and it was a beautiful cup. And so the instructions then, and every time since, have been, um, you know, do, do you know where your cup is? And most people actually do. They know what it looks like. And it's usually unique and wonderful. And it's merely a metaphor for, I am not junk. I am made in the image of God, and God loves me, and God sees me as unique and precious. And then the, then the task is to go outside, take the cup to Jesus, and say, Jesus, what would you like to put in my cup? And, and Jesus, every time, affirms each individual in a unique and, and special way. Um, I've given you a very, very lightning tour through um, burnout, uh, through its principal cause, which is an internal conflict, um, and the most likely cause of burnout, which I find in at least 60% of clergy, if not more, and many non-clergy, is that they've not been adequately affirmed, and that they've been given a utilitarian cup and told, go into the world and be useful. <laughs> and the more useful you can be, the more you will be valued. Which is so utterly destructive of the Christian faith and of human beings. And so dishonors the cross of Christ. And does not take sin seriously. See, I find Christians are schizophrenic. They, they take sin so seriously, except when it's happened to them. <laughs> and then it doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It's not important. But sin, or in anywhere else, it's so, it's the center of the the gospel, its sins are forgiven. And sin is damaging, it separates. Sin separates us from God and us from people. Um, do you know what taking seriously your, your parents' sin does? You take seriously how lovely your parents were as well. It actually stops the resentment. Um, if you don't deal with sin, the psychiatrist was talking to my sister years ago, and he said, you know, tell me about your parents, and she told some horror stories about parents, and uh, she said, okay, do you have any siblings? Yeah, I have a brother. Uh, where is he? he? Oh, he's in Canada. Oh, the psychiatrist said, oh, he put 5,000 miles between but I'll tell you, I'll finish with another story. Um, my journey to external affirmation happened 35 years ago. I was in the kitchen in Calgary, and I was chopping up an article um, from the Calgary Herald about something I'd done. And I was putting it in an envelope, and my first wife, Julia, was around the corner in the kitchen, and uh, she became suspicious of my behavior. And uh, she said, Trevor, what are you doing? And I said, oh, nothing. Um, she wasn't at all satisfied with that. So she, she said, Trevor, what are you doing? And it took a pretty stern voice, and I said, oh, I'm um, just, um, uh, uh, just sending this thing to England. <laughs> I thought I was sufficiently vague. And she said to me, 
Trevor, are you still trying to get your father's approval? And I said, no. <laughs> and I had been polarized. I, I was done in. I thought, I've spent my whole life trying to get my father to tell me he's proud of me, that, that I please him, that I'm good enough. And I said to myself, this has got to stop. I cannot continue to live like this. Um, and so I went for counseling, and uh, uh, it's interesting that the picture I have on the screen of the, the little, little guy and uh, the big Irish daddy with a bag. Um, in counseling, uh, this little boy grew to the same size as his dad, and I'm uh, looking at my father now as this grown man, saying, and you want what? From who? And why? <laughs> why are you going to lay your whole work at the feet of someone who generally actually doesn't have the best son, is not a Christian, and actually doesn't know you at all? And, and so to, to other people, I say, assemble a panel of five people who know you well, who have discernment, and who respond with grace and with truth. Not in this wishy-washy cultural, you know, you're wonderful. Truth and grace. And then I say, now, is your dad in the panel? And they say, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what are you up to? Uh, you want to be self-destructive behavior, making your whole worth dependent upon a person who doesn't have a sermon, know you well. You're putting your life in their hands for that to have the, have the ultimate word about your worth. Now, when I said, Dad, I'm, in my head, I'm taking back my life out of your hands. I'm not going to leave my car parked outside your house in England 5,000 miles away. I, I'm going to take it back. I, I went into a period of grief. I grieved that I would never hear my dad's approval. And the grief went on for weeks. And then suddenly one day it changed and I, I realized I'm grieving still. But do you know who I'm grieving for? I'm grieving for my dad that he never got to affirm me. That he never got to do the role of closeness between father and son. And I know, you know, with my boys, what a gift it is to, uh, to, to be able to affirm them. And how that brings us close and, and that intimacy that comes from uh, being able to look out for your boys, even though they're you know, mid 30s, and just keep saying, I love what you did. It's so courageous what, you, what you've been up to. So, uh, you know, you're just going to have to buy the book, I'm afraid, because. Uh, the publisher says it's about a, um, a month away of being an e-reader and uh, two months away from a hard copy. You want to do a book launch at Google? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, I noticed uh, point 15, seeking comfort in destructive ways, overrating pornography, fantasy, etc. Um, would you comment on the, uh, the correlation between burnout of this sort and um, ministers in whatever capacity public, publicly disgracing themselves in one form or fashion. Could there be a correlation in your mind? Not speaking of any specific uh, examples, but yeah. as a broad point statement. I think in the end that, that core value that I'm just not worth anything, eventually um, under the right circumstances, which are of stress, of exhaustion, then I will actually act out of my core that belief, which is, well, I'm, I'm of no value, so what I do doesn't make any difference. So people who commit suicide actually get to the point of believing that my killing myself won't make any difference to anybody. So yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's, it, it's, we do, we, we help people so much to get to the core value. But you see, like, um, you know, if you're working with someone, as you know, with, with abuse, the 
But one thing they do not want to talk about is their abuse. Because they've internalized it, uh, usually 70 to 100%, as shame, that they, they have the problem with, they're the one with the problem. So why do I want to expose my shame? So why do I, so the corollary then is to this stuff, is why do I want to talk about my childhood only to discover that actually I was a bad child? That I was an unlovable child? Why do I want to go there? Let's make it all about my parents, and it doesn't matter about what, how they re reacted. But actually, the core value is I'm a bad child. I was an unlovable child. And I don't want to go there. So we're talking about, you know, oh, I think it's much more noble to, you know, excuse parents. <laughs> That's not what it's about in the end. Yeah, guys, you've been wonderful. It's right on time. Let's stop there. If you want to chat afterwards, feel free. But um, thank you for your rapt attention. <laughs>